Picking up where we left off on the four cornerstones of value creation, I just want to mention the fourth cornerstone, which we did not get to in the last session. So the fourth cornerstone talks about competitive advantage. And this is, again, based on the readings that you've done for this week in the book. And there's two great graphs that should be burned into the back of your brain. I did not put them in the PowerPoint, but they're in the book. And what they basically say is that over time, companies, ROICs, and growth rates regress to the mean for large organizations. Right? And the key is nothing lasts forever, particularly competitive advantages. So <clears throat> when Warren Buffett invests in companies, when he invests, and a lot of people use this, they call it the moat theory. So the idea is that you want to invest in a company that has some form of competitive advantage, a moat around the company, just like a moat around the castle. And that moat can be several different things. It could be a patent, it could be a brand, it could be a process, it could be a regulation, it could be a lot of different things, but it does give you some form of competitive advantage because if you're good, people are gonna attack you, right? And you have to be able to withstand that competitive attack. So Warren Buffett's ideal investment that he talks about is he says, look, I'd like to have a knight in a castle ever expanding the lands, growth, and I'd like to have a moat around the castle to protect that growth to basically make sure I, I have some enduring competitive advantage, right? But here's the problem with the moat theory. <clears throat> what if nobody wants to invade your castle anymore, right? So I, I think about a, a month or so ago, I was working with a company called Nokia, <clears throat> And they were completely disrupted from the handset business to the point that today they're out of the handset business and they actually licensed their, uh, <clears throat> their brand to a Chinese company that's making Android low-cost clones. So Nokia doesn't even make phones anymore. Yet a decade ago, they had like 70% of the retail market. I mean, they were a very dominant player. You know, same thing with BlackBerry. BlackBerry phones were the business phone. And today, they don't even make them anymore. So the point is within 10 years, they went from two of the most dominant phone carriers in the world to not existing. So I'll, t I'll make the same prediction today. We're going to be talking about the iPhone the same way. I don't know if it's 10 years from now. I don't know if it's 20 years from now. But that needs to be our perspective. Nothing lasts forever. No matter how good that product is, it's going to basically go away because the market's going to change. Competitors are imitating already. They're coming up with a lower cost competitors. I mean, if you see the reviews for the Samsung, was it Note 8 or the Galaxy 8? You know, everybody's ooing and eyeing about the engineering and the architecture and the screen, and they're kind of caught up with Apple. All right, so <clears throat> long story short, that needs to be our perspective when we think about companies. And then the graphs in the book basically show regression towards the mean. So for competitive advantage, I want you to think of it as today it's now called the wave theory. That your competitive advantage of a company that you're evaluating is a wave. It's going to crash. So it's no longer do they have advantage, it's for how long. And the only way you earn above average returns compared to your peers is if you have some form of advantage. So that's what we're looking for. We're looking for companies that have advantage, but even when they do, we assume it doesn't last forever. So it's a wave, it's going to crash. But here's the other thing. Like any good surfer on Bondi Beach, what's the next wave? See, from an investor standpoint, I care about five to ten years from now. So not just the market today, but the market of tomorrow. So I'm looking at a companies that are also going to do well tomorrow, which leads to another Warren Buffettism. He says that when Warren Buffett <coughs> buys companies, he buys companies that he's going to own forever. Well, when you're 86 years old, that's kind of an interesting timeline. Right? But, but the real point is, he doesn't really mean he wants to own them forever. What he's really saying is, I want a company that's going to be in a market that's going to be really good for a long time because I'm not worried about an ebb and a flow, but if the market's good long term, then I have a good chance of success. So what he says is find the great markets for long term and then find good companies that will do well in the market for long term. That's the perspective because I don't want to be in the business of, of yesterday or even today. That's why I mentioned Gilead in our last conversation. Because the problem with Gilead is they're doing well today, they don't have a tomorrow. And ironically, I don't know if anybody saw this, I found this out in the last section of the day, that on Monday, Gilead bought a company called Kite Pharmaceutical for almost $13 billion. So I basically said they got a hole in their portfolio, and it was ironic that that day, 
They actually plugged the hole by buying a company called Kite Pharmaceuticals to get into the oncology business. <clears throat> so that was the point, is that they, they were struggling the future. They had to buy their way into a better future. Although I wonder whether or not this investment is truly going to pay off. Because the idea of the company they bought <clears throat> is they bought a company that has a revolutionary cancer treatment. What they do comes straight out of The Walking Dead. Basically what they do is they extract your blood. They use genetic modifications to modify your cells to learn how to be attack dogs. They re-inject these attack cells back into your body and it attacks the cancer and kills the cancer. Okay, So revolutionary. It's what they're doing, and it's had some really interesting early successes. Cost seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars a treatment. Just put that in perspective. Seven hundred fifty thousand dollars to do this. So one of the questions for Gilead is how mass market a product is this going to be? Like how many people can afford a seven hundred fifty thousand dollar treatment? And more importantly, how many payers, insurance companies, are actually going to pay for that treatment? So that's kind of the, the plus minus of their acquisition about the future. So they're buying their way into the future, but they're spending a lot for a $750,000 treatment. And whether or not they're going to get the mass market of that remains to be seen. So that'll be a risk with that investment. The flip side is Tesla, we talked about it on Monday, is all about the future. All right, it's all about the market for sustainable transportation. And so that's why people like Tesla. They just happen to be the big dog in that market right now. But the flip side is long term, that is a growing market. So that's the point. I'm looking for the markets of the future. I'm looking for companies that are going to do well in that future. But even Tesla, down the road, sustainable transportation will eventually mature. You know, if we're talking about tech companies, right now, it's Facebook, it's Alphabet slash Google. It's increasingly Microsoft again. You know, it's Apple. Uh, it's NVIDIA. Those are the companies that are doing well today. Go back a decade. It was Wintel. It was Dell. It was HP. Go back another 10 or 15 years. It was IBM, right? Today, IBM is struggling. So that's the point. Nothing is going to last forever. That needs to be part of our point of view when we do evaluation. Nobody's going to maintain 20% revenue growth forever. If for no other reason, it's called law of large numbers. Nobody's going to maintain higher ROICs forever. Ironically, you also see the other thing that was talked about in the book, which is for big established companies, you don't maintain underperformance for long periods of time. Think auto industry because people stop investing. And at that point, it's Darwinian. You either improve or they let you go away. And that's what's now starting to happen with some of the brick and mortar retailers is that people are going to stop investing and it's going to be sink or swim and they're either going to improve or they're going to go away. So that just needs to be our overwhelming perspective in valuations because one of the common mistakes people make is they overestimate how long those cash flows last. They overestimate how long those ROICs and growth rates stay high. And that's just going to be important as we go through the valuation. So I'm just telling you, your bias, if I teach you very few things this semester, should be nothing lasts forever. And things come to a close much faster than we think it does for a lot of these companies. So <clears throat> let's talk about key value drivers. So based on the reading this week, the key value drivers model framework is a very important framework that we're going to be using all semester long. It is summarized on this PowerPoint slide. And at a high level, three things are going to matter to valuation and value creation. One of them is called spread, which we talked about on Monday. The second is growth, right? And here's the thing I want you to understand about growth. Growth does not create value. I'll say that one again. Growth does not create value, right? When I do this with corporate companies, corporate clients, I actually make them repeat after me at this point. Growth does not create value because that's their bias. It's like, we're going to grow. We're going to make a lot of money. No, it's not the way it works. Now, here's the thing. I had a venture capital startup. I got a $6 million Series A. Company eventually raised $29 million before we sold out. When I started the company, all growth looked good. Because I went from no customers to go finding customers. So I was signing up anybody that wanted to work with me. But even as an early stage startup, I quickly realized that there were some customers I wish I didn't have. That they really didn't want to do too much. They wanted a lot of stuff for free. They didn't want to pay for anything. I was chewing up a lot of resources for kind of bad customers. Well, that's actually not a type of customer I want to keep growing by. 
I don't want to grow by having to do stuff for free. I don't want to grow when people aren't going to spend money on me because then I'll never actually create any value off of them. And so at some point when you're a more established company, particularly for larger companies, we have to distinguish between good growth and bad growth. Right? And I'll give you an example. So if we go back into Bloomberg, it'll log in. Remember the oil and gas industry data I showed you in our last class? Okay. What was the ROIC approximately, I'm logging in, for those oil and gas companies? About 3% last year. What was the cost of capital for those companies? Remember the WAC? It was around 9 Right. So if you're borrowing at nine and making three, do you want to grow that? Actually, you get worse off. <clears throat> you're going to go out of business borrowing at nine and making three. So that's the point about growth. Growth doesn't help you there. All right. If you're borrowing at nine and you can make 15, well, I want to do that all day long. So growth is the accelerant to value. It's not value itself. And what matters is the growth spread, the growth ROIC combination. So that's the point. If I have a great growth opportunity, positive spread, grow that, create value exponentially. If I have a bad growth opportunity, negative spread, negative NPV, I don't want to grow that because that's like going to hurt my business over time. And then finally, <clears throat> key value driver, it's called sustainability. That gets back to what I just said in the fourth cornerstone is that nothing lasts forever. High growth rates don't last forever. If nothing else, it's called law of large numbers. As you get bigger, it's harder for Apple at a $220 billion revenue to grow as fast as Google because Google's only $90 billion in revenue. Right? Not that 90 is not a lot, but the percentages are different when you get bigger. And so the same amount of dollar growth for Apple is not the same amount of dollar growth for Google when you turn into percentages. So that's the other bias we need to have is that growth doesn't last forever. So when you say this company's going to grow at 10% for the next 10 years, no, that almost never happens, especially when you get to very large organizations. And we've got to recognize the key to sustainability. So that's the point. How long? How long before growth regresses down to average or zero or the market matures and goes away? Or how long before the ROICs come down to more of an average versus a way above average perspective? All right, so again, Starbucks, you know what, they're 30%, 32%, whatever that number is, that's not going to last forever either. So the question, how long before it starts to come down? All right, that's the time to maintain competitive advantage. Those are the key value drivers that the math talks about that we're going to do this week, and it'll be part of your next homework assignment. So continuing on. Get a little technical here, and again, I'm just summarizing what you read in the book. Yes, sir. Unfortunately, I can't make the PowerPoint full screen because I'm recording this in QuickTime, and when I do, it kills the QuickTime video. So, blame Hollywood. All right. <clears throat> or Microsoft. Or Apple. Just not me. <laughs> okay. I, I really wish I could. I'll make it. How about that? A little better? All right. So, again, this is in Lecture 1, which you guys should have access to as a PDF. So, back to this. Uh, definitions. So one of the definitions that the reading talked about this week was no plat, net operating profit, less adjusted taxes, right? In the real world, people will also call this no pat. And no plat is the McKinsey term, no pat is the more generic term. Those are relatively interchangeable, okay? So if you see no plat, you can also think no pat. No pat stands for net operating profit after tax. The idea is operating profit or EBIT after tax. So it's the after tax profit from operating your business. All right. So let's just say we have a hypothetical company that makes $100 million per year of NOPAT. Now, what is the company going to do with those profits? What I find to be ironic is I'll talk to companies, and I was just on the phone with them a few minutes ago, and what they'll say is there's eight things we can do to deploy our cash. And I kind of chuckle because there's really two things you can do with your cash. Like you can overcomplicate it. But you can either take your profits and you can either put it back in the business or you can pay it out. Now, how you pay it out, okay, I can do a dividend, I can do a stock buyback, I can fund a pension obligation, I can do a debt payment. All right, we can get to that level of detail. But practically, there's only two things you can do with a profit. You can either put it in or you can pay it out. 
So that creates two very important ratios that we're going to use a lot this semester called the investment or reinvestment rate and the payout rate. So let's just say this hypothetical company that makes $100 million of NOPAT takes $50 million and reinvests in the business, <clears throat> takes the other $50 million, pays it out. 50% reinvestment rate, 50% payout rate. Okay? Now those two percentages have to add up to 100% of the profit. Therefore, one minus the investment rate is the payout rate, one minus the payout rate is the reinvestment rate. Okay? Yes, sir. In this class, we cover um, like the thought process behind the reinvestment versus giving back to the shareholders and yep. why we want to do one or the other. Exactly. I'll, I'll give it to you right now. Okay. This is as simple as it's going to be, and it's gonna, you're going to struggle with it, but this is as simple as it is. If you can take that money and you can make ROICs or IRRs greater than your cost of capital, what should you do? And if you can't? I, I would argue that you could always. No, you can't always. Just, I'm just telling you, in the oil industry right now, can they deploy capital and make 12 to 15 percent? Doing what they're currently doing, no. Exactly. But it wouldn't they, you know, hypothetically, they find a new way of refining oil or. So here's the point if they hypothetically find a new way that can earn 12 to 15 percent, reinvest it. If they can't, what should they do? There you go. That's your rule. As simple as it is, that is the rule that a lot of companies struggle with. And it's not how you've done in the past. It's how you're going to do in the future incrementally. So that's the point. If I have a positive spread incrementally over time, then I want to keep it in the business. If I don't, I want to give it back to the investors. right? And that is really the decision rule that will have a lot to do with value, and the math will support this. So we'll build to that, but that's actually the punchline. So let's come back to this. On this screen, I want to define two things. Growth, specifically sustainable growth or organic growth, which we're going to call G, and free cash flow. So let's we'll start out with G. G, which is known as the sustainable growth rate, which means it's the rate at which a company can grow organically with internal funds. To grow faster than this rate, you have to either do M&A or you need external funds. Okay, so this is what will fund the business theoretically internally. Okay, so here's G. Let's take this hypothetical company on the previous slide that makes $100 million and is reinvesting $50 million. Let's just say, to keep the math simple, this company makes a 10% ROI. It made 10% on historical investments. It's going to make 10% on future investments. Okay, so I have $50 million at 10%, which means I'm going to get $5 million in new profits on my investment next year. And... If the business continues to make 10%, the underlying business is still going to make $100 million. So next year, I'll have $105 million worth of profits. I would basically grow my profits 5%. Right? That would be the G of the company for one year. Right? Now, here's the thing. I'm going to shortcut this with a mathematical equation. The mathematical equation for G is the reinvestment rate, 50%, times the expected ROIC. I make 10%. I reinvest 50%, 10% of 50 equals 5. That is my theoretical growth rate. That is my, and if I did this over a long period of time, that would be my G, because G is a perpetuity. Okay? Questions about that? All right, so assuming we all understand G is reinvestment rate times expected ROIC, how do I take the G for this company, this hypothetical company, Instead of 5% a year, get it to 10%. I want to double my growth rate. What do I need to do? What are my two options? Yeah. You can cut back your investment. To? You want to cut the reinvestment rate to how much? Okay, so what's 25% of 50? So, <clears throat> sorry, reinvestment rate is 25%, sorry, 25% reinvestment rate of 10. What's 25% of 10? Two and a half. So cutting reinvestment doesn't help me here. Yeah. So double the reinvestment rate means make reinvestment 100%. 100% times 10 is 10. Or I double my return investment to 20 Half of 20 is 10. But here's the ironic thing. 
one way we can grow is we can put more capital in, more reinvestment, or the other way is actually make higher returns on our investment. You ever wondered why Google and Microsoft and Apple have so much cash? They don't really need to borrow any money, yet they're growing very rapidly like weeds because they have high ROIs, high ROICs, and that gives them tremendous ability to grow. So in two weeks, when we talk about the reorganizing of the financial statements, we're going to introduce a new term called operating ROIC. Okay? Operating ROIC is something McKinsey does that we're going to do, and it's not something that most of the rest of the world does. They do regular ROIC. Here's the difference. The standard ROIC that I showed you in Bloomberg, so let's go to Alphabet as an example. Here's the RV screen. Here is the spread we looked at it Monday. This is the standard ROIC as defined by, by uh, Bloomberg and what the investing community is last year Alphabet's ROIC was about 13%. All right, that is basically the return on the debt and the equity. Okay, but here's the deal: when we reorganize the statements, we're going to divide it into what we call operating assets and non-operating assets. Okay, operating assets are things that actually drive revenue, meaning I invest in these things and that leads to more sales, whether services or products. Non-operating assets have nothing to do with my sales. They have value, but they don't actually drive sales. So again, if I think about a company like Google slash Alphabet, they got a bunch of cash sitting in the bank. Having cash sitting in the bank doesn't mean more searches on their search engine, which are driving ad revenue. So that's non-operating. Has value, value it separately, but has nothing to do with what they need to do to sell more search. Then what they actually spend on servers and R&D, et cetera, is operating. Okay, the two together will average to this number of 13%. So here's the thing. We are going to create a custom field in Bloomberg, which I have done and you will do as an upcoming homework assignment to basically add something called operating ROIC. You'll see it's called a custom field because it doesn't exist in Bloomberg. Right? And it's just going to look at the operating ROIC, not the average ROIC that operating and non-operating. <clears throat> For Google, that number is 35%. So that's the point. Google, when they actually do googly stuff, makes 35%. When you throw in all the cash sitting in their balance sheet, they make 13%. If they sell more stuff and they don't change their cash balance to start paying it out, then the ROIC of the company is actually going to look closer to 35% long term. And this is one of the insights we're going to do when we get to valuation. But the point is their operating ROIC is about 35%. Everybody see where I'm getting the data from, what I'm talking about just conceptually? Okay. So let's do this. Yes? What is the Apple 493%? So that's the point. Apple has an ROIC of 19%. But Apple has like $240 billion of cash on hand. If you take the $240 billion of cash on hand out of the equation, when Apple sells iPhones and iPads and computers, they actually make a ridiculous almost 500% ROIC. They are just a cash generating machine, which is why they have $240 billion worth of cash, because the ROIC on their products is ridiculously high. All right? So that's, that's one of the insights we're going to start to get. So here's the point about Google. How much does Google pay in dividends? Anybody know? Zero. How much do they buy back in stock? Give me a hint. Zero. How much debt does Google have? Okay. What's their payout? Zero. So Google's payout is zero. They're not paying any money back. And they don't really have any dividends or stock buybacks to pay back right now. So 0% payout. Therefore, what's their reinvestment rate by definition? 100%. Okay, so let's go back to this equation. The equation is reinvestment rate for Google slash Alphabet, 100%. What's their ROIC on new investment? 35. What's 100 times 35? 35. Google's G is 35%. 
they can grow their profits 35% sustainably without new investment. They have the internal funds to do that. Here's the thing. If you maintain constant margins, assumption we often make, then growth in sales equals growth in profits. So assuming Google maintains its margins, it can grow its top line 35% a year. So let's go back to Bloomberg. This is the earnings estimate overview right now for Google. And this is their growth rate for the next several years. Last year they grew at 21%. This year it's expected to be 20, then 18, then 15, then 15. How fast can Google theoretically grow? How fast are they going to grow? In 2017. 20. What happens to the difference? It adds to their cash balance. So I'm telling you that Google's going to add a bunch of cash to their balance sheet because they actually make enough of a return to fund all of their growth and still put the rest in the bank. That's why Google doesn't need borrowed money. Let's talk about Apple. Even with Apple paying out $10 billion of dividends and buying back $20 or $30 billion worth of common stock, Apple's making whatever $50 billion of notepad or whatever it is. You know, their reinvestment rate's like 60%. But here's the thing. Um, Apple has a 500% ROIC. So you know what's going to happen to Apple? Even with all the dividends, even with all the stock buybacks, even with all their R&D investment, including the billion-dollar data center they're building in Iowa, even when they do all that, and the new spaceship campus that's opening next week, they're still going to add to their cash balance because of their ridiculous ROIC. So that's, that's the point we need to understand. Here's my comment about Tesla that I made on Monday. Tesla's a negative ROIC. So how does Tesla grow? Well, first, they've got to fund the losses. Then they've got to spend all the money to grow. So that's the point. That's why I don't think companies like Google or Apple want to get into the car business because it's a huge amount of investment for a low rate of return, which means you chew up a lot of cash to do that. And that's just not their business models today that have made them successful. So I just don't think that Google wants to get in a business where it actually has to make low returns for tons of money. Right? Because that's just now what they, they can do as a business historically. It's actually going to hurt their valuation. So again, these are some of the things we're going to start to understand about the companies that we value. And this is called sustainable growth. Questions about sustainable growth or G. Okay, second concept on that slide, something called free cash flow. <clears throat> um, a number of years ago, Mercedes, Daimler-Benz, bought 5% of Tesla. And they've subsequently sold it, but they basically bought 5% as strategic investment because Elon Musk was running out of cash. They were going to go bankrupt, and Daimler kind of saved the day. All right. In return for that 5% strategic investment by Daimler, Daimler got access to all, the Texas, all of Tesla's technology. And starting with the 2017 Mercedes E-Class, they've actually taken Tesla's technology and they put it into the Mercedes E-Class. So basically the Mercedes 2017 E-Class has the same tech as a Tesla, hardware-wise. And they had access to, to Tesla software, and the Mercedes engineers made a choice to dumb down the software because they thought that the Mercedes drivers would crash and they weren't ready to do full self-driving tech. So it could do it, but they have their own version called Drive Pilot, which does assisted driving, but it doesn't do as much as the Tesla, but the hardware theoretically can. Yes? Uh, sorry, I do have a question about growth. Sure. So The G is the perpetuity G. So if you were to evaluate the company, would you extrapolate literally up to that growth rate if it were Google? Like For Google, we wouldn't use 14 or 20% as a theoretical long-term growth rate. Because okay. the perpetuity growth rate, think of it as a 30-year growth rate. It's going to get closer to 4, 5, 6%. Right. Right. So actually, your homework assignment for Monday for the company Raytheon is to estimate their G. So this is actually the point is of why you're going to do the assignment is to start figuring out what is a G for a company. What do they actually look like? And how do we estimate that? But we'll come back to that. So let me go back to my Mercedes story. So I got excited about this, and I actually decided to lease a 2017 Mercedes. So I have one of these cars. It was cool. It was cheaper than the Tesla, by the way. So, so here's the thing. I leased it from Mercedes-Benz of Catonsville, up near where I live in Columbia, 
And there's a place called Highway 40, which I was test driving it on. And it's like a four lane road, two on each side, and it's a windy road with a lot of traffic. And so the point is, we left the dealer, I'm in the car, we're going about 60 down this highway, speed limit 55, and he's like, turn on the drive pilot. So you just hit a button, and it basically sets the car so it drives itself. And he said, take your hands off the wheel and your foot off the brake and the gas, and just let it do it in traffic around corners. And I hadn't even bought the car yet, and I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm gonna wreck this car, hope I don't die, and then I'm gonna be responsible financially for this car that I haven't bought, because the, the sales guy's trying to impress me. And it was terrifying, because literally, we're flying down the road, and then we hit the curve, and I'm like, is the car gonna go flying off? No, it actually kinda did the curve. And I see cars cut in front of me, and then the car actually slowed down to let it in. And it was cool. And I decided, now I have the car, because I was like, this is cool, I want this car. And <clears throat> actually, the most exciting part of the, of the drive pilot technology is not what you think. The best part of it is 495. Because when you're sitting there in traffic, you just put it on and let the car move, stop, move, stop, and you have to pay attention. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't pay attention, but I don't pay as much attention as I probably should. And this is on YouTube, even better. So I do pay attention. <laughs> I do pay attention. But the car does a lot of paying attention for me, and it's kind of cool. So the reason I, I mention all this <clears throat> is that I've gotten out of the, I'm now in a stage of life where <clears throat> I don't like used cars that break down, just too much of a hassle. So generally I get a new car every two or three years. That's why leasing actually works for me. I like to have a new car, I don't want it to break. And <clears throat> I kind of like the new cool tech, tech. So here's the point. Let's say I decide to keep this Mercedes because I'm happy with it for 10 years. But I don't want to do any maintenance on the car because I don't like doing maintenance. So no oil changes, no tires, no tire rotations, no fixing the tires. You think the car is going to make it 10 years with no maintenance? No. So i got to do some maintenance on the car. Whole story metaphor. Company's the same way. A company is not worth its future profits. Got to get that out of your minds. right? Because just like a car, you have to do maintenance on the company. If I don't put some of those profits back in the business, what I have today is going to crumble. So I have to maintain what I have. So i got to take some of the profits, i got to reinvest to maintain. If I want to grow that company, add some stuff to it, i got to put some of the profits in to grow as well. So the point is, the value of the company is not its future profits. It's the profits after the reinvestment. And the problem is, there's no accounting term for that. So the finance people created our own term, and that is called free cash flow. So free cash flow, which we're going to get very specific about the definition, but if you think about it conceptually, is just profit after reinvestment. And free cash flow is the theoretical payout rate. That is the cash that can be distributed, and that is the value of the operations of the company. So one of the things we're going to do is we're going to figure out the free cash flows, the operating free cash flows, and we're going to use that to value the operating part of the business. We'll value the non-operating part separately, add it together, enterprise value. We'll get to that in two weeks. But the key is <clears throat> free cash flow is theoretical payout rate, is value of the company. Now, just because Google and Apple choose not to pay out all their free cash flow, doesn't mean that at any point in time, Tim Cook can just wave his magic wand and write a $200 billion check to shareholders. Right? So they can pay it off, they just choose not to, but nonetheless, that's part of the value that Apple has created. Questions about that? Okay, so we're gonna get into how we calculate free cash flow later, more specifically, but it's basically cash from the income statement minus cash reinvest in the balance sheet and working capital, capital expenditures, and goodwill. Those are the three things that we're reinvesting in as a company for operations. So this boring looking slide is actually one of the critical ones we're gonna cover this semester. And this kind of ties everything together with a key point I want you to understand. So we have this hypothetical company A we've been talking about. It makes 100 million profit growing at 5% a year. <clears throat> and we have their company B, competitor, makes the same products. They're also making $100 million of profit growing at 5% a year. So two companies, identical profits, identical growth rates. Because they're peers, let's assume they have the same whack. So same risk to either company. So two companies, same products, same profits, same growth in profits, same risk. Would they have the same value? Are A and B worth the same, given the data on the slide, if it's expected to continue? Or would one be worth more than the other? What do you think? Yeah. Well, if the investment are 
Yeah, this is all operating. So which one do you think is more valuable, A or B? B, why? That's right. We just said free cash flow is the key to value. So B has more free cash flow. B is more valuable than A, even though they have the same profits. Everybody agree? All right, here's the logic I want you to follow. Why does B generate more free cash flow than A? Because they don't have to make as much investment. Just repeating what she said so everybody hear it. They don't have to make as much investment as A to sell the same stuff. Everybody see that? Why doesn't B have to generate the same amount of investment to make the same profit? Because their ROIC is 20 and A is 10. This is the most direct way I can show you this semester that ROIC is a proxy for free cash flow. They're the same thing. If you really want to know the secret to McKinsey's success and what I'm teaching you this semester is free cash flow's valuation, but free cash flow is hard. Walk into any company, try and calculate free cash flow, it's hard. You gotta figure it out from the financial statements and you got a bunch of confused people that didn't take finance that are struggling to understand what it means. Talk to them about ROIC. They get it. They're the same thing. McKinsey realized that. ROIC valuation is what they do. It's free cash flow valuation with just rearranged equations because ROIC is a proxy for free cash flow. It's easier, it's cleaner, it's more understandable. That's why they're winning. That's why when JP Morgan goes in there and the CFO and even some CFOs are like, I don't know what the hell you're talking about, but they're smiling and writing checks. All right, McKinsey goes in there, oh, I understand ROIC. That's easier for me to do. That's why they win. And I'm just telling you, academically, it's a cleaner way of doing the valuation. That's what this class is going to be about. It's ROIC-based valuation, but it's free cash flow just by another name. And this is the way you can see that the two are equal. So here's the thing. At the same level of growth, if you have a higher free cash flow, you, oh, sorry, higher ROIC, you will generate more free cash flow. You will be more valuable. That's what the math shows me. And you can see it right here on the screen because company B makes 20%, A makes 10%. I need to invest half as much to make the same profits. Therefore, I'm going to make more to my profits. Or I invest the same. Company B invests 50 at 20%. They make more profits. More profits minus same investment is more free cash flow. Either way, I'm going to get more free cash flow with a higher ROIC at the same level of growth. Now, what gets tricky is companies don't have the same level of growth. Apple makes a ridiculous ROIC of almost 500%. But Apple's challenge Is their growth last year negative 7%, 5, 15, 1, 3? Google's growth was 20 down to mid 15s. Apple's just not growing like Google was anymore. So here's the thing if you actually take Google's high growth rate times their lower ROIC, and you take Apple's high ROIC times lower growth rate, you get two companies that are actually relatively close in value in market cap. Right? And so that's the point. Google's getting the market cap because of the higher growth rate. Apple's not getting the benefit of the 500 because they're searching for the next big thing. If they ever figure out a way to grow, it would be a lot easier. But when you're $200 billion, it's hard to do that. So long story short, that's the tricky part in the valuation. It's the growth return, growth spread combination. Questions? Okay. So we now have to value this theory. So let's go to the next slide. At the bottom of the next slide is something called a perpetuity. The difference between a company and a project is projects end and companies are assumed to last forever. So therefore, i got to forecast the cash flows forever, hence perpetuity. So that formula at the bottom of the page is a growing perpetuity. But the challenge with a growing perpetuity is it assumes the IRR on historical investments equals the IRR on future investments. And that often doesn't happen in the real world. And that's the biggest problem with the growing perpetuity equation because we will you know, if we're doing poorly, we'll always do poorly. We'll never improve. We'll undervalue the company. If we're doing well, we'll never do poorly. We'll overestimate the value of the company. That's what you're taught in business school, and that's what people use in the real world, and that's a challenge with the growing perpetuity equation. So I'm not saying McKinsey perfected it, but they tried to make it better by creating what they call the key value drivers formula, which is a rearranged growing perpetuity, and that's what we're going to use this semester. So here's the rearrangement. 
Rearrangement number one, cash flow is free cash flow. Therefore, profit times one minus the investment rate. The formula for sustainable growth is the investment rate times the ROIC. Therefore, investment rate equals growth over ROIC. Sub an investment rate, and you get that formula on the right. So the formula on the right is a growing perpetuity, but here's the difference. That ROIC is the incremental ROIC of the future. It's not your past ROIC or another proxy IRR in the future. So that's the point, is by using this key value driver formula, we can actually have a different ROIC for the future than we had in the past. Now it's one number for the whole future, but at least it can be more representative of what the future looks like for the business. All right, and that's called key value drivers, and this is gonna be one of the things we use throughout the entire semester. This is a core to this class. So here's what I wanna do. I wanna take this formula, and I wanna take the data that was on this slide. And when you told me that company B was more valuable, I want to do the math. And I want to see exactly how much more valuable this is. And by the way, this is going to be very important to your homework assignment. So <clears throat> I did this in the last class. So on Elms, I uploaded it after the last class. <clears throat> There's a folder called homework one. And in this folder called homework one is the Excel file that I'm about to create. Okay, so if you download this file and use it in Excel, you can either follow along and or you can use this to help you do your homework one, which will be due next Wednesday. Okay, so let's go back. So I'm gonna open up Excel and I'm gonna just start from scratch. this a little bit bigger. Okay, so we have company A, company B. First, we have expected profit. We have G. We have expected ROIC. And we have the cost of the capital which is the whack. If I know those four things, I can value the company using the key value driver's equation. So based on this slide, both companies started out with $100 million of profit. Both companies were growing at 5% a year. Company A had an ROIC of 10, which is expected to continue. B was 20, which is expected to continue, and both of them had the same cost of capital of 10%. So when I asked you which company is more valuable, you intuitively said B because they had more free cash flow. Let me ask you the same question again. Looking at this data, the components of the formula, what's different about company B versus company A? Is anything else different? Now, so that's the point. Key value drivers, ROIC is the only difference. Let's see how much more of that higher ROIC, therefore proxy more free cash flow, because that's the point. Per dollar of investment, A is making 10 cents of cash profit. Per dollar of investment, B is making 20 cents of cash profit. If they grow that at the same rate, 20 cents growing at 5% a year is worth more than 10% growing at 5% a year. That's what we're going to show mathematically, right? The same discount rate. So here's the formula, which is this formula, key value drivers, putting into Excel with the correct order of operations, equals left paren. Profit times left paren 1 minus G divided by ROIC, right paren, right paren, divided by left paren, WAC minus G. Company A is worth a billion, company B is worth a billion five. So we're just quantifying that B is actually worth 50% more than A. Now, there's something called a multiple of earnings. Think PE multiple. What is the price to earnings multiple of business A? Price 
prop value divided by earnings, price divided by earnings. They trade at a PE of 10. They trade at a PE of 15. So what I want you to understand is that multiples are not some alternative valuation that has nothing to do with cash flows. Multiples are actually based on free cash flow valuation. They're the same thing. It's just another way of expressing it with rearranged math. Matter of fact, key value drivers, what determines What determines the value of a company? Well, it's right here. These are the drivers. These are going to determine the value. These are going to determine the multiple. And so that's what we need to focus on, hence why they're called the key value drivers. That's what the math tells us. So let's do a little what if. How do things change? Company A doubles its profits, gets a big win. But nothing changes about its business model long term. Still going to make 10% ROIC. Still going to grow at about 5% long term. Still going to have the same level of risk. They just get a big profit win. They double their profits. What happens to their value? What happens to their multiple when I hit enter? The value goes up. You think the multiple is going to stay the same? So he actually went to the spreadsheet and did this. So what's interesting is some people actually might think, oh, well, the multiple is going to go down. Or they might think the multiple is going to go up. Right? So let's see what actually happens. Triple. There's company B, double. All right. When you took Finance 101, this is called sizing. Right. I am more valuable because I generate an absolute more amount of cash. Just bigger DCF. So that makes me more valuable. So I'm bigger. But it doesn't make me better. Meaning people aren't paying more for my earnings. I just generate more cash. So what causes people to pay more for my earnings? What causes a change in the multiple? It's not how much profit you make. It's these three things which are called the key value drivers. Growth, return, cost of capital. Or, said another way, growth and spread. Multiples are an expression of expected growth and expected spread. That's what a multiple is. Higher multiple, more growth, more spread. Lower multiple, less growth, less spread. Yes? Did we cover how to solve for expected RRC spread? Uh, indirectly, yes. When we build the models, we're going to actually have to do it. So you're, you're going to be doing it at least 10 times after the midterm, including your group projects. That's going to be one of the key things is back to forecasting. How do we forecast what these ROICs and cash flows are going to be? Yes. Okay. Other questions? Okay. So <clears throat> let's talk about changing the multiple. What if business A goes into a new market that allows it to grow longer term, faster, sustainably? Business B does not, all right? But nothing changes about their business model. So Walmart goes into Mexico, all right? They're still low cost, but they got a lot more growth than if they just stayed in the US, okay? So same return, same risk, just more long-term growth. What happens to the value? What happens to the multiple when they start growing at 6% a year versus 5% a year? They both go up. Multiple stays the same, but value goes up. All right, I see some people shaking their heads now because they know the answer. All right, so let's, uh, uh oh, low battery. So let's actually see what happens here. Okay, so here's 6% per year, by the way, compound forever. 7, 8, 9. 
three, zero. Let's make sure I didn't make a mathematical error in the spreadsheet I uploaded. Six, seven, eight, nine. As the growth increases, nothing's changing for business A. As the growth increases, B is getting exponentially more valuable and the multiple is going up. Why? Yeah. For? Exactly. What's the spread of A? What's the NPV of all those projects? What are they borrowing at at business A? 10. What are they making? What's 10 minus 10? There's no value being created. I like to call this the treadmill, right? Basically, you run really fast, you don't go anywhere, and eventually you get tired. That's business A. This is not good growth. So, <clears throat> real world story. Later this month, I'll be back at Merck doing a session for them. And one of the reasons I've been there a lot for the last year and a half is their stock price is not going anywhere. I'm explaining to them why, and it's finally making sense. Because Merck is growing their earnings, Merck is making a lot of money, but their share price isn't going anywhere. So I'll give you the secret to my success. Why is their share price not going anywhere? What do you already know is going to be true of their share price? That's going to drive it. Why is their share price not changing? Because they're a pretty close to zero spread company. So here's the thing. Let's look at Merck. Let's look at their share price. And here is five years through this morning of Merck share price. And since 2014, it's been pretty flat. Why? Because you already know the answer. If I go back to the same RV screen and I look at Merck against its peers, which we looked at on Monday, and I go to the spread template that I saved, you already know what this is going to tell you. That's Merck. Doesn't matter how fast you grow. If you have a zero spread, your share price isn't going to go up. Good growth, bad growth. Right now, for Merck, it's not good growth. So what should they do? How? So what does that mean in the pharmaceutical industry? So potentially consolidate some underperforming drugs, sell them off, you know, not, not focus on those because, or let somebody else acquire them, you know, get rid of the investment, especially if it's low ROIC. So it's a good potential. So that's the point is we can start generating options or more importantly, we can talk to the companies, let them generate the options, but we're asking now the right questions. And now we understand why, unless they do some of these things, their share price is not going to go so well. So let's go back to Gilead and the Kite Pharmaceutical acquisition that they just did this past Monday for $13 billion. Why did I say that I'm worried about that paying off? They spent $13 billion for a treatment that costs $750,000. So one could say, gee, at $750,000 a treatment, they're going to make a killing when a lot of people that have cancer start using this treatment. What's the risk? Yeah, if they have the 750,000 people and very few people can actually afford to do it and they just don't get the volume. So they paid $13 billion for a business with no revenue, right? That's going to be their risk. So actually, that's the Wall Street Journal article that came out Tuesday about this acquisition, which is basically what's the price going to be? Because nobody predicts it's going to go forward at 750 because they're just not going to get the volume. And so that's the question. At what price point, which volume relative to that investment is going to determine the return on investment, and that's going to determine whether they make money in that acquisition or not. Because what companies typically do is they tend to overinvest in these acquisitions. They don't get the lift, the revenue profit lift, and the ROIC in the investment is low. Right? I was having an argument two months ago with Anheuser Busch InBev over the exact same thing. Okay? They've had success buying companies, basically gutting companies, and getting the ROI out of acquisitions up. The problem now is SAB Miller. They spent $100 billion on SAB Miller. 
hundred billion dollars, right? So let's just say that they want to make 15% ROIC. What does that mean? 15 billion of no pet. How often? Every year. So if I look at ABI right now, And let's just say their tax rate's relatively low. Matter of fact, here is their tax rate. I'll come over here to custom. And effective tax rate for them, well, it was in the 20s. Last year was actually closer to 37%. So let's just say it's 20 to 25%. They get some effective tax breaks by being outside the US. So 20 to 25%. So if they're making 15 billion of after-tax profits, they probably need to make 20 to 25 billion of pre-tax profit improvements per year to justify that acquisition. So here is their EEO. EBIT, 13 billion to 2022. Last year they were 13. In 2020, the analysts expect them to be at 22. How much is that? What's the 13 and 22? Nine? That's pre-tax. Take, take a quarter of that out. We're down to seven, round off. What's seven divided by 100? If all of that is attributed to the SAB Miller acquisition, they're going to make 7% of that. There's a one-year stock chart of Anheuser-Busch and Bev. This is my disagreement with them. They think that their share price is going to go up because of this acquisition. I'm worried that it won't because based on the actual numbers that are being forecasted out there by the financial community, they're getting $7 billion of after-tax profit for $100 billion of investment. I'm not saying it wasn't the right strategic decision, but they sure paid a lot of money for it. And this is with all the synergies priced in. And that's why their stock price isn't going up this time because they're not buying a small company and it's turning into a big company. They're buying this gigantic company and yes, they're getting cuts but they're going to have to do something much more draconian to get rid of a bunch of the assets or something else to lower that denominator, or the numerator is going to have to go a lot higher. So this is what I'm telling you, that you need to understand these conversations. Later in the semester, we're going to keep practicing so you have a better understanding of what's going on with valuation. Key value drivers. Questions? Okay, so back to this. Two more quick scenarios. Reset this. What happens if you are Coca-Cola? And your revenue is expected to go from 42 to 35 to 30. Because people have decided Coke is bad for them. And the US last year, sales of bottled water eclipsed sales of Coke. Okay. So that's actually really bad for Coke because they have a little bit of water. They have, what, Dasani. But other than that, it's not like that's their whole business. And they're losing sales of both Coke and people perceive Diet Coke to be just as unhealthy. They're drinking less soda. So what Coke has decided to do is they're slashing marketing. They're cutting out a bunch of spend because what they said is we don't need to market if people aren't going to buy the soda. So we're going to maintain our margins even though we're selling less stuff and we're going to maintain our returns. We're going to get rid of assets. We're going to cut staff to maintain the returns, even though we're not going to grow as fast long-term as you thought we were. We'll eventually return to growth. We'll figure it out. But it's going to be a tough few years. So, key value drivers. What happens when the long-term growth rate goes to like 3% from 5%, but they maintain the spread, company B? What happens to the value? What happens to the multiple? Say, I price you as if. I price you as if you're making 20% growing that at 5% a year. I realized I was too optimistic. I now have to reprice you at 20% growing 3% a year. That's a lower multiple. That's a lower share price. What if you're HSBC, which is a large struggling European bank? Problem that Europe is having in their banking industry today is since the financial crisis, loan volume and revenue is down 20%. There's, they're literally having 20% less revenue for European banks. But the number of banks has not changed since 2008. 
because in the U.S., we actually consolidated the big four, where four banks are now 80% of the retail market. If I'm just guessing, your bank is either going to be Wells Fargo, Citi, J.P. Morgan Chase, or Bank of America. Those are 80% of the U.S. banking industry as those four banks in the U.S. today. In Europe, same amount of banks, because there's no way that Italy is going to allow their bank to be owned by Madrid, Banco Santander, or BBVA. That's just not going to happen. So, or the French are not going to let the Germans buy a French bank. So in Europe, they have not shrunk the amount of banks, yet revenue is down 20%. So all those banks are fighting for smaller amount of customers. And it's destroying the European banking industry, financial services. And the regulators don't have a solution for this that they're willing to politically go to. Because the political solution is let a lot of those banks merge, consolidate, fail, but nobody wants to do that. Because it's that's Europe and everybody's proud of their own country. So they can't get past their pride. So long story short, what happens when you're HSBC, you're in this situation and you try and grow? We're just gonna we're just gonna win by just getting more volume. So we're gonna go out there and aggressively loan to people. So what do you do if you're a European bank? Shrink. That's what the key value driver says. If you have a negative spread, shrink. Don't grow. Because that's really bad for you. You just destroy value at a faster rate. Growth is the accelerant to value. These four lessons that I just showed you are the most powerful thing I could show you this semester. Because if you understand the key value drivers and you understand the direction they're moving, you can explain most of the share prices without doing the math. This will help you understand why things are happening right here. This is the core theory for the class. We're going to do the math. And we're going to get into detail, but it's all going to be recurring themes with more detail, getting more granular, but it's around these concepts. Key value drivers. Questions? All right, homework one. You're going to need to do homework one. I'm going to do an example with homework one using United Health Group. So here's the thing. This is based on value is actually called enterprise value. If I want to do a PE multiple, which is based on net income, earnings per share. This is based on no plat, which is based on operating income. So I can use the exact same math, but here's what's going to change. This is expected adjusted income, net income. So it's the earnings. This is the G, growth in the EPS. This is the ROE, not the ROIC. And this is the cost of equity. Same formula, but I'm just doing equity because I'm actually going to solve for a PE multiple. Okay. And I'm going to do the value, which is the market cap. So, what's going to matter for UNH is the ticker symbol. When you go into Bloomberg, <coughs> type in the ticker symbol, UNH. This is in the instructions, and this is being recorded on the video. Here's United Health Group. Okay? <coughs> you're going to need two screens once you go to the company. Now, when you do United Health Group, you're actually going to do a company called Raytheon. But when you start typing in a ticker symbol, or you could also start typing in, like, their name, and down here, it'll filter out the security name. In Bloomberg, corp is debt. So equity is the stock. You want to go to the equity. And then what market it's in, U.S. means it's a U.S.-based stock. So ticker, market, equity. Or ticker, corp, which is debt. So U.S. equity. All right. Screen number one. Once you're in a company, whack. This will do a real-time whack based on CAPM. Right? So instead so of you doing it manually, Bloomberg does it for you. So specifically, here's their WAC, but more importantly, here's their cost of equity and cost of debt and the weightings. So we're going to use the Bloomberg cost of equity based on CAPM. You can actually click here and see the CAPM. But basically, that's the CAPM at cost of equity today, 8.9%. So let's go here. And for cost of equity, 8.9%. Okay, 
Second screen you're going to need is EEO. EEO stands for Earnings Estimate Overview. That is the screen that gives me the forecast from the analyst of what companies are going to do in the future. <clears throat> 2018 is the first forward year that's a complete year. It's called FY2. Right? So we're halfway through 2017. That's forward year one, FY1. Next year, forward year two, 2018. For valuation, the multiple on FY2 is the more important one. So we don't care about historical multiples. We care about future cash flows. And the second forward year is the first full year of the company's being forecast. That's more normalized, and that's what the analysts tend to focus on. So in this case, 2018 for Raytheon, 2018 for United Health Group. Right now, net income adjusted for 2018, 10, 5, 7, 6. We're going to solve for the expected G the market's using. Now I need an expected ROE. If I scroll down or hide, there's a forecast for ROE for the next four years. These are the number of analysts forecasting. There's only one analyst forecasting 2020, so we're just going to use the next three years. So let's take an average of the next three. 21.4, 21.5, 27.3. That's the expected ROE for United Health Group for the next three years. I'd actually want to do an average, but the interest of time, I'm going to eyeball it and say that's close to 23%. So I'm going to use 23. All right, but theoretically, you should do A plus B plus C divided by 3. Okay? But let's say 23%. Okay, so here's the point. If I copy this formula over, that would be the estimated PE that our little key value driver model has given us. And this would be the value using the key value driver formula. Now, right now, based on this share price, the 2018 PE based on that price divided by those earnings is 18.04. Actual. So here's the thing. I want to know what G gets our model to match 18.04 because that's the G the market's actually using for United Health Group today. So start. you can either do the solver or start plugging in. So let's just say 3%. 4. 5. 5. Not that. So 4.5. Four point four. Now I'm getting really close. So what I'm telling you is somewhere around four point somewhere around four point four percent, four point four three percent is the G the market would have to be using to justify their current share price today. That would give me a multiple of eighteen. That would give me a market cap of one ninety one. Their actual market cap right now, you can find that on the DES screen, is 189. So, non-operating asset difference between the two. But what I'm just showing you is that this is not some mathematical thing that's just, you know, separated from the real world. This is what actually explains the stock prices. These are the key value drivers. And somebody asked about G. This is the G that explains it for United Health questions about what I just did. All right. Your homework assignment due Wednesday at 10 a.m. for all sections is do the exact same thing and estimate the G for Raytheon. Ticker symbol RTM. Yes. We're going to talk about that right now. So in order to do the assignment, a couple quick things. Number one, and I put this in the instructions, the screens whack and EEO, because in order to prove you're going to do this at a different time, which means the PE is going to be a little different based on when you do it, in order for the TAs to grade it and figure out why your PE is the right PE, I want you to take the EEO and I want you to take a screenshot. How do you take a screenshot? If you see this little box up here across the top, it's kind of hidden here. There's a box up here that looks like a box with an arrow. It says take, take screenshot. And then you can click save, and then basically save is a file 
a GIF file somewhere, either on your you know desktop or a USB drive. Email it to yourself. Take it on a USB drive. But basically, that's your screenshot. You'll have to upload the screenshot of your EEO as part of your assignment. I put this Excel file that I created in Elms. So you can use this Excel file to help you do what we just did. I've just recorded this on video. So the question is, how do you get to Raytheon? So here's the final piece. I'm going to log out of Bloomberg, and you will need to create an account. The good news is it takes three minutes. All right, once you're at a terminal, Bloomberg is just software, okay? So you launch the Bloomberg software by clicking on the icon on the desktop, and it should start to load, all right? When you load the Bloomberg software, you hit the enter key, which is also called the go key, and it'll bring you to a screen. So it just takes a while to load here. It'll bring you to a screen that asks for your username and password, all right? At the bottom of that screen, You don't have a username and password yet. There's a link that says, create a new login. Click on that. Answer the questions. Who are you creating this login for? Myself. Don't say someone else. It's a trick question. All right. Have you ever been a Bloomberg terminal user before? Unless you have an account from elsewhere, just say no. Next, enter in your name. Choose a login name. They'll give you one based on your name, but choose one that's available. It'll tell you if it's not. Put in your cell phone number. You can put in the same one for both. And any email address that's a real email address from you. It doesn't have to be a umd.edu. It could be a Gmail or a Yahoo email or whatever. But put in a real email address. Because on the next screen, it's going to say, send a code to either the cell phone as a text message or the email. You're going to take that code, six-digit code, and you're going to type it in and it's going to give you the account and allow you to choose a password. That's it. That's all it takes to sign up. The key, though, is you have to do it at a Smith terminal, either in this lab or the one downstairs. Or if you're one of the lucky few, you have a SendBit Fun terminal, you can use it down there. But the rest, they're not going to let the rest of you in there. So essentially, basically create the account here. And I'd try and do it even right now before you leave. Take a couple of minutes. Because here's the thing. You're going to have to go in, Raytheon, using the spreadsheet, Get the data, take a screenshot of the EEO, submit the Excel spreadsheet showing a matching PE and showing the uh, screenshot of the time for the PE you did it, and turn that in by Monday at 10 a.m. This is not a group assignment. This is an individual assignment. This is your introduction to Bloomberg. Final thing, BMC. You can start taking the, the Bloomberg certification. BMC, once you have an account, is where you do it. There is a class code. The class code is in the homework assignment. You can type that in. It should associate with this class. All right. So again, have a happy and safe Labor Day weekend. No class on Monday. We'll talk about this on Wednesday when you get back. Okay. Earlier,